So by the end of today, what I would really like you to understand that maybe you don't understand yet is the connection between human understanding and human learning and the connection with machine learning and artificial intelligence. So that is what I would like to focus on today and I will give examples which I will come back to again and again during the talk on biomechanics and on medicine and I will also give some examples from uh, everyday engineering applications in particular for wind energy I will talk about cancer I will talk about astrocytes about how to model the brain and I will talk about what the psychologists think uh, we are thinking like and how we think and how we learn and this is what I'm going to focus on today so I would like to start with a quote from Laplace uh, which is uh, Pierre-Simon Laplace in a philosophical essay on probabilities. That's uh, one of his most well-known works. And uh, what he's saying there is that we may regard the present state of the universe as the effect of its past and the cause of its future. So an intellect, uh, which at a certain moment we know will know all the forces that set nature in motion and all positions of all items of which nature is composed, if this intellect were also vast enough to submit these data to analysis. So if we could know everything, where things come from, and if we could analyze them, it would embrace in a single formula, so the movements of the greatest bodies of the universe and those of the tiniest atoms. For such an intellect, nothing would be uncertain and the future would be just like the past and would be present before its eyes. So it would be able to predict the future because they would know all the past, what started in the past, all the actions that took place in between the past and the present, and therefore would be able to predict what would come next. So this is, sounds a bit like determinism, and it's related to the idea of stochastic understanding and probabilities. So this is my team in Luxembourg that I uh, would like to thank because they have provided a lot of effort in order to make these slides possible. In particular, all the work that I will be showing comes from them and from all of my previous collaborators over the years. I would like to thank everybody that was on my team and that is on my team for their continuous support and help. So this is a slide that I use often because I think it's uh, highly useful to understand where things come from. We um, are modeling the world, and we will come back to that in the Applied Mathematical Modeling course. We model the world assuming things are continuous, and sometimes they are not. They, we have discrete problems as well that you can model differently, and we'll come back to that. But once you have a continuous problem, you create a mathematical model from which you create a discrete problem and from which you create a numerical solution. So you have this sort of sequence and in many of the talks that I gave before I talked about the model R which is for example how do you connect the continuous problem to the mathematical model so you create a mathematical model at that moment you make a model R because your model which is the mathematical view of the universe is not exactly what the continuous problem is like so this is a model error and this is answering the question are we solving the problem the right problem which is are we solving the right problem meaning are we validating the method so this is the validation question second question is from the mathematical model to the discrete problem are we solving the mathematical model so the set of equations as precisely as possible given what we know and for a given quantity of interest and this is called the discretization error and the point which is to be very well understood about that is that the discretization error is not universal it depends on the quantity that you're measuring so if you're measuring number of people flowing in an elevator or number of cars on a highway or if you're measuring the flow of fluid in a tube or if you're measuring heartbeats or if you're measuring the risk for stroke and so on if you're measuring um, archaeological uh, buildings and this is what you're interested in then the discretization error is always going to be different is it the displacement the stress the temperature the concentration in species is it the uh, atp production of the astrocyte 
and so on and so forth. So it's very, very important to know what quantity you're interested in when you solve a mathematical model, because that is going to define the discretization that you use in order to minimize the error on the mathematical model. And similar in the choice of the model, one should not believe that there exists one single model for the continuous problem that we have. There exists many such models. And the problem is to select the model which will give you the most adequate description of what you're interested in and I will come back to that when we talk about applied mathematical modeling. So now, how do we build ourselves an understanding of the world around us? We're talking about mathematical models, and that's clear for engineers or mathematicians or physicists or people from the sciences. They will know what we mean by a mathematical model. But is it the case isn't it the case that we all build a model every day when we live our lives, when we feed our children, when we read a book, when we try to understand a movie, when we read a foreign text, when we try to understand a foreign language, when we try to write and read, when we try to discover a new place and learn about it, when we move to a different country? Aren't we modeling the world around us and that's what we're going to see now how that works and how that can help us understand the novel ways that machines can learn as well so if you confront your hypothesis of the world this is what you do every day so you walk around and you see people for example now uh, you maybe you know me for a while maybe you don't know me but you are currently making a model of me, myself, the speaker. So you're wondering about my voice, you're wondering about the way I speak, you're wondering about where I'm going, you're wondering about where I went. You are trying to establish whether I'm a good speaker or a bad speaker because you have a model in your mind of what a good speaker is. So you're comparing me with what you see. So you have your hypothesis about the world and you're comparing that to your evidence, which is what you see now, your, your observations, essentially. And this is what you do all the time. And the question you're answering is, how probable are my observations? So how probable is it that this person is giving a good talk, knowing my initial hypothesis? This is something which is at first counterintuitive, because you're asking how probable is something that you see. And of course, because you see it, in your opinion, your, the probability may be one, but that's not the case. Because we are asking how probable are my observations, knowing my initial hypothesis. So that's quite different. This is the law of conjunct probability of probability of A knowing B, as we will see. So you merge your hypothesis with what you know and what you see. You merge your hypothesis with what you see and that gets you the likelihood. And the likelihood tells you how to build new hypotheses about the world. How does that work? So for example, you are attending my talk today and now your view of a good speaker will be changed. You will not see a good speaker in the same way because maybe I did something as good and maybe I did something less good. So your view of the ideal speaker will be slightly different. It will be a bit more of me and a bit less of me. And it will therefore change your hypothesis in certain directions. Therefore, the likelihood becomes a new hypothesis. You have now this new view of what the best speaker would be. And then you will meet a new speaker because maybe tomorrow there is another seminar and you're going to go to this seminar and listen to this person and you will have evidence that is going to be brought to you by this person that you see. And now the question is, what's going to happen next? Well, of course, you're going to merge your hypothesis, which are new now, and your new evidence, and you're going to build a new version of the optimal presenter. And you will ask every time the question, how probable is it that this person is the best speaker I've ever seen? And how probable is it that my observations are true given my initial hypothesis? And so this is exactly what you do every day, every minute, every second. And this is not, not just me saying it, as we will see. Okay, why is there a tennis court on this slide? You probably are wondering this, and I, I don't mind it because it's not very easy to understand why I've, at first. So let's try to understand. You're playing against a tennis player. 
whichever tennis player. You can imagine the one you like best. And this tennis player is, as far as you know, because you observe their games, you're a very serious tennis player, you're not some average guy like me. So you look at the balls and you see where they usually fall because you analyze all the videos of this tennis player, you're really serious, and you want to understand where these balls fall usually, you know, what is his habits or her habits. Where does, does he serve, where does she serve in the court? And you see they are usually here. So, okay, you just start there and you imagine a little circle here, a Venn diagram, and you say, okay, well, this is where I expect the balls to fall. But then you see the player on the other side of the court starts to move slightly to the left. Their right arm is angling at the back in a way which gives you an intuition that given his position on the back line, he's not really in the center, he's more to the, to the right, and so you think, hmm, he's going to probably cross the ball and he's going to aim somewhere here. So this is what looks likely based on what you see now. This is your evidence. And this is what you know, your hypothesis, because you, you are used to this player or you analyze their way of, speak, of, of playing. So you know, at least you think you know, that this is where things will happen. And why is that important? Well, because now you have an initial knowledge, which is the left circle, and you have another knowledge, which is what you see, which is the evidence. So you have a hypothesis and the evidence, and that gives you an idea about the observations. That gives you an idea where things will happen. And this is called the posterior knowledge. So you have prior knowledge about where the ball will fall. You have likelihood function, which tells you where things are likely to fall because you see what is going to happen. So this is basically a guess based on the evidence. And then that gives you a posterior, which is the intersection between the prior and the likelihood function. Now, if you look at that in terms of probabilities, what you know a priori is known as the probability of X, probability of the fact that something will happen, that the ball will fall here. And the probability that the ball falls here, knowing what you observe, is here. And the probability of X and Y is here in the middle. So this is a combined knowledge. So the posterior is the prior multiplied by the likelihood divided by the evidence. And this is how things look like. The posterior is the probability of X knowing Y. So probability of what you know, of what you, um, what you know, knowing what you see. Okay, so now let's try a little experiment and see what happens in the brain of people like you and me when they learn something. Um, let's try to see how people learn and uh, I'm basing what I talk about here on the work of uh, very talented and very well-known uh, people known as Stanislas de Haine, for example, and he's basing his work on uh, the work of uh, others as well, uh, who is at Collège de France and he's a psychologist. So now let's try to understand what would happen here exactly. So we have a set of objects in a balloon, in a bowl, in some sort of container, and you see there are two colors. And one color is more numerous than the other color. And now you obfuscate this, and one comes out. So basically you put someone in front of this, you show that there are three objects of a certain color, and the fourth object is of a different color. And your question is, what will be the reaction of the person that you show this to when this little thing comes out. So if it comes out of this color or of the other color, which is more rare, is there going to be a difference in the way that the people react? And uh, what is really interesting is that if you see that uh, the little thing that comes out is of a probable color, it's very likely that it works that way because of what you see. So for example, if you have a majority of uh, blue-like uh, dice and someone which is yellow or, or green comes out, well then uh, the problem is that you will be surprised. And if something comes out of the same color of the majority of the things that are in the, in, in, in the, in the bowl, then you will not be surprised. 
So if what happens is what you expect, you are not surprised. If what happens is not what you expect, something else, then you are surprised. And the question is, when does that happen? So this is improbable and this is probable. And what's really, really interesting is that in this paper by Tiglas uh, in um, developmental sciences, they show that as early as 12 months old, so children as 12 months are already able to understand the difference between these two scenarios. And this is something quite remarkable because it means that at 12 months we're already able to differentiate between something that is probable and something that's not probable. And you can take a look at the paper by uh, flashing this QR code. So as you see, babies as early as 12 months are already surprised by things like this. So now let's look at another approach uh, to learning. Learning how to write. So in, um, in our uh, society, let's say in, uh, in Europe, we write letters that look like this. And these letters have very specific shapes. So as you can see, there is a P here, there is a D here, and a B here. And you see that they look very similar to each other. If you take this P and this D, they look quite the, quite the same. And as you can see, this little uh, ch child here who, who is writing is writing in a way uh, which is a bit, a bit peculiar. And let's see why that happens. So let's imagine that you, uh, you see such a picture. So you see the picture of this king in front of you. And you see the left facing and the right facing. And you're wondering, why am I seeing a picture of three kings? So <laughs> The reason why I showed this picture is because whether you are seeing this picture or the previous picture is for you approximately the same. So if you see someone which is three quarters in that direction, you will see the, mostly the right part of the face. If you see someone that's looking in this direction, you will see mostly the other part of the face. But in your mind, these two people are recognizable. You will not confuse them. You will see that it's the same person because in your mind, there is an inbuilt symmetry. And why is that it, the, there is an inbuilt symmetry? Because the faces of people are roughly symmetrical. So you are used to seeing things in a symmetric way. How does that relate to writing? Well, if you see these two people here, uh, what I did is I made a mirror image of the picture. They look to you exactly the same. What can we imagine would be the impact of that on learning how to write. In other languages like uh, Chinese, Mandarin, uh, Japanese and so on, things are and Korean very different because there are very different ways of writing. But in uh, uh, our alphabet, if you write Odil or if you write Libo, they are exactly the same because you see you have a mirror image of Odil is Libo. And that means that when you write, you basically will tend to confuse the Ds with the Bs, and you will tend to write the Ds as if they were Bs. Let's see how that works. Well, uh, that works like that. Basically, what happens is that in that case, you are, have an inbuilt, ancestrally built over hundreds of thousands of years, sequence of operations in your brain that make things look symmetric. And when they are symmetric, you think that they are the same. So here, when you see a D, it is symmetric to the B. So for you, you are just seeing the same thing. You are not seeing two different things because your mind is used to seeing symmetry in the faces of people that you recognize. So this is really uh, very funny and very interesting, I think. Because in that case, your brain, which is your a priori knowledge, the way that you work, is going to actually uh, decrease the probability that you recognize things and that you are very adapted to the world in, in around you. So you're basically, you have to unlearn the symmetry and know that now for letters like D and B, these letters are not, are not the same letters, they are different. So how does that help us? Well, the hypothesis, and this is also dating back to a psychologist Gopnik, and she was saying that the baby is a scientist in the crib, 
and uh, this is really what you see when you see your kids uh, basically take some spoon and throw it on the floor and then take the other hand and throw it on the floor and this is a universal thing all kids do this they all paint their face with food when they eat you know like this and they try to see if their hair changes color and they try to test the physics of the universe themselves every day when they try to understand it this is the way things work and so the hypothesis is that the brain is able from birth or maybe before to perform statistical calculations and perhaps even we could say Bayesian learning. And this is how it relates to what we're talking about in mathematical modeling. Because the brain has a set of hierarchical hypotheses which it projects onto the world, <coughs> rigid objects, causality. And what is that set of hypotheses? Well, this is nothing else but what we call a model. And we will come back to that. This is a model. And the hypotheses are selected based on their plausibility, so the likelihood, knowing the evidence. So, for example, if I take my spoon as a baby and I throw it on the floor, or I let it drop, even better, I drop it, I see, oh, gravity is working when I drop it with my right, right hand. And now I change hands and I drop it again, and my parents are really mad with me because they have to clean the kitchen, but they, I keep dropping it, and then I drop it with, with my mouth, then I just throw it off the table and then I throw it backwards and every time I see that there are two things that happen. One is that the thing falls and two, my parents pick it up and put it back on the table after cleaning it. So I learned something. First I learned that gravity is universal and then I also learned that the love of my parents is universal but their patience is maybe not infinite. So I learned something all the time. And this is the key point that uh, I would like to, to make about this point. Um, and another point which is super important, which I learned from Stanislas Dehaene's lectures, is that most signals in the brain are error signals, uncertainty signals, and without failing we cannot learn. And this is something very, very useful to understand for people that are educators like us, professors in universities or teachers in high school or in primary school or anywhere else. Um, you know coaches, sports coaches, and so on, we uh, should definitely keep in mind that the signals that are taking place in the brain are mostly error signals. So they are measuring the difference between what we think is and what actually is. And not only about learning, but about other experiences as well. So this is really interesting because when we go to school, we tend to be always told off that we did made a mistake. So we get negative points if we do something wrong instead of getting positive points, because everything we, we do that is wrong is teaching us something. So every time we, we get something wrong, we should be told, great, you did something wrong, it's amazing, because now you know something you didn't know before. So this is this ability to basically uphold being wrong, which can help people learn. So to me, it's fascinating. Having children and looking at how they learn is something which uh, is a piece of knowledge that I've already used. Um, and finally, uh, the last point about Stanislas de Haen's uh, discussions is that you need several things to be able to learn. You need attention, you need to pay attention to what's going on. You need a reward, so this is a bit related to dopamine. You need curiosity, so you need to go and seek information, so you need to be interested, this is also related to dopamine. You need sleep, because uh, you need to replenish your dopamine stores and you need to make mistakes, you need errors in order to learn. For example, this presentation is not the first presentation I give. I made many presentations before and I failed utterly and maybe today I'm failing again. But I'm fa if I'm failing and I get feedback, then I will learn something. And that's why it is very critical to try things out without being too afraid and then to just jump in it and try to learn from this. So there is an idea that the brain is a Bayesian machine. You can take a look at the paper associated with that by scanning this QR code, but it will be on the slides that I give anyway. And, and so if it is a Bayesian brain, what can we say about it in terms of mathematical modeling? Because this is why we're here. In terms of mathematical modeling, the world is very simple. 
you take an input x and you give an output y and you have some sort of functional or function f which is a mapping a, co a connection a black box you give it x it spits out y that's what it is and in the world of mathematical modeling you in fact have essentially two cases you have model calibration this is what we always talk about when we are engineers or when we do medical sciences and we model the body we try to figure out what are the parameters in the model that we can fit and how do we fit those parameters and what does it mean to fit the parameters what it means that you have a notion that uh, the world behaves in a certain way so you have a function maybe this function is a like a parabola or maybe it's linear you could say for example the covid cases are increasing exponentially with time which is not what you like of course well, if you have this exponential growth, you have some coefficient in the exponential. And that, co that coefficient is unknown a priori, but you would like to calibrate the coefficient. You'd like to find out what this coefficient will be. So this is called model calibration. So you know the structure of f. Here it's an exponential. But you don't know the parameter. You don't know if it's exponential alpha t, what alpha is. And this is a bit of the problem, because if alpha is too large, then people will be contaminated faster, and the things will go even worse. So for example, this would be this would be one, uh, one solution. You could also think that if you have an epidemiological model that tells you the number of new cases every day, well, this model has a few parameters to it, and these parameters are useful to, uh, to know, and this is called calibration, so you compare observation to what you see. And how do you do that? Well, you usually do a minimization, which is an optimization. You compute the norm, so the difference, the distance between what you see and what you know, and again, isn't that exactly what babies do when they learn the forces of gra gravity like Newton did in the 17th century? So the second approach is that you try to identify the model, meaning you try to find the model because you don't know what the model is. So for example, if you take the example of neurons that are firing in a worm, which you see here at the bottom right, those are neurons in a worm. And what's nice about these worms is that they have very few neurons. You can count them and you can enumerate them and you know all the genes that are associated with these uh, neurons. So you can do whatever you like with them. And uh, this is something extremely useful uh, because then you can essentially model the, the whole worm. And you can model that using data only because there is no model really of the behavior of these neurons. And you can confront it to an eventual models of the firing of the neurons. So you could actually do both model calibration if you were able to write a model of the neurons firing and you could do model identification if you were just using the data but you would not be interested in knowing exactly what the functional form f would be only measuring things that you see and nowadays we are really in the cusp of two approaches one is the newton approach this was the picture that i just showed before this is Newton here uh, I used him because he's very well known in mechanics and very well known everywhere so it's very easy to understand and on top of that he's well known but he was not right about everything he had seen things as he observed but uh, someone after him Einstein came and uh, was able to show that his hypotheses were right to a certain extent but could be wrong in other limits. So this is why I think Newton is an interesting person to write there. And so he's writing basically hypothesis based models. He's looking at things falling from the sky and he's deducing that gravity is a universal force. And then on the other hand you have what's here a Twitter connection graph. So what you see here are all the connections between a certain individual and other individuals and a network of connections in Twitter. So what you, s you see is basically a cloud. You cannot make head or tail of that. But uh, the question is what exactly uh, is that useful for? What you can do is you can use data science and data driven methods in order to make sense of that and use statistics and, and so on. So this is known as data driven model. So every time I'm talking about a model during the talk today, I will use these two pictures in order to remind you of what case we are at. And typically we are neither on the left nor on the right. We are somewhere in the middle. And I will do my best also in the talk to remind you where we are. If we are on the left, on the right or somewhere else.
So this is what we're interested in. We're interested in discovering a model and the models are learning from both ends, the hypothesis-based models and the data-driven models. And we are in between and we have what we build, every, every one of us builds adaptive models. And this is exactly what we do as human beings learning something. So now I will show you a little experiment and I would like you to uh, play the game with me and you will, I hope, be interested. But before we do that, um, I would like to show you how things work in the realm of um, machine learning because everybody these days talks about machine learning, machine learning this, machine learning that. Uh, and I think it's interesting to just see machine learning as nothing else but a way to minimize error on a certain observation. So what you do here is that you have a set of observations and this set of observations is different from what you actually think. So you are going to build a line. So this line here is going to be an approximation of what you see. Right, but this line is a first guess. The first guess is typically wrong. So what you want to do is you want to change the slope, for example, of that line in order to best capture the stars. And how do you capture the stars? Well, what you compute is the loss function. And the loss function is the sum of the squares of the distances between the stars and your model. So again, what do you do? You compare what you see to your model to what you think you know. And then you adjust the line until you have a line which is essentially the best possible model for the set of points that you have. So this is really what you do in machine learning. I mean, machine learning is a super uh, powerful way of doing a regression. At least one part of machine learning is doing this. And uh, how do you do it? Well, you compute exactly that, which is a least squares regression. And that's it. And so neural networks are essentially exactly the same thing. What they do is exactly that. They have an input layer, which in that case is three numbers, so a vector of three entities. You have some activation functions and that you see here, so sigma for example, and you have a prediction which is some sort of combinations of the input of these coefficients theta 1, theta 2, theta 3 and some constant b. So you have the prediction uh, which is the sum of the inputs times theta i plus b and that's it. And then that gives you uh, u which is sigma of z uh, using the sigmoid function that transforms the uh, prediction that you have here, the linear part, into um, u. And uh, then you can write the functional that you want to minimize. And then what you do is you do backward propagation. So what does that mean? Well, what you do is very simple. You do theta i, so the new theta, is equal to the previous theta, minus alpha, some coefficient that you, that you have, divide, uh, multiplied by the partial de derivative of the loss function with respect to the parameters. So that's all you're doing. You're, you're updating the neural network and you keep doing that and uh, incrementally you will get to the stable point, which is the minimum point. And that's it. That is neural networks. So it's really a way to do some serious minimization. And um, What's really cool about that, and I would encourage you to take a look at these three papers that uh, are here by Saurabh Deshpande, who will defend his PhD thesis in a uh, few weeks now. And I really recommend that you take a look. And if you want uh, to follow the PhD defense, that is also possible. It will also be put online. Um, we have medical simulations, and we try to see if we can play a bit with these fancy looking elephants and uh, the idea here is to guess the deformed shape from pre-computed solutions. So the inputs are pre-computed solutions so we impose some forces on the elephant and then we let it deform and we measure the displacement and we teach a neural network 
how the hyperelastic material is working so that the, the neural network can predict the solution. Very similar to proper orthogonal decomposition, when you predict the outcome of the deformation of a beam without knowing the force that will be applied to it a priori, because you were able to train the beam deformation on a different case, right? So you train the beam deformation by preloading it, you do that offline, and then you use those simulations to predict the deformation under a different load in order to accelerate the simulation and use that for real time. For example, here the breast deformation under gravity, which was made um, in order to help solve, uh, let's say, surgical simulation problems arising in uh, breast cancer. So now um, all you need is attention. So you probably are aware of ChatGPT and very similar uh, language models. And what you what you see there is that the attention mechanism in ChatGPT was about originally 3,000 uh, words, uh, and that beyond that, you're not able to, uh, to actually have the attention that you need. So, because we're talking about attention, I'd like us to... ChatGPT um, reached a record-shattering record 1 million... Uh, ...to play a little game. So now you have to focus a little bit and read what's written. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. How many passes did you count? The correct answer is 15 passes. But did you see the gorilla? This video is from research by Daniel Simons and Christopher Chabri and is copyrighted. It is available for use in talks, training, and teaching on DVDs from Fizcog Productions. Learn more at theinvisiblegorilla.com. Okay, so uh, we will discuss after the talk uh, how many of you saw the gorilla, and uh, well, this time obviously I saw it because I know how it works, but originally I hadn't seen it. And this is due to the fact that when you focus on one thing, in that case white, because you are told to focus on the people wearing white, you focus on really only the white and your attention is in a tunnel and anything else that's not white, you barely see. So you taught yourself in the first few seconds of the video to ignore anything black. And because you ignored anything black, because otherwise it was confusing, because the two balls were being thrown at the same time, so your brain could not follow which ball was what, so you taught your brain very quickly, in a few seconds, to ignore anything black on the picture. And then when this gorilla, which is black, comes into the picture, you ignore it as well, although it looks completely different from the other players in the, in the video. And I think this is very important because when we give a talk, usually people fall asleep after some time and it's a very good way to wake them up. And also it's very useful for uh, to understand machine learning because machine learning uh, is also based on attention mechanisms, as is the work of uh, Saurabh Deshpande that I talked about before. Okay, so now that we are all awake, we can continue the presentation and talk about data-centric Engineering, which is the name of a new journal uh, where I've been collaborating for some, some time now at Cambridge University Press, where I encourage everybody to submit papers. It's a very nice journal, which is multidisciplinary and takes data as the center. Um, so this is also what we do in my team. So I, I uh, already went through in another talk this uh, big data 
versus time, so data versus time, small and big data versus time, where exactly was I at any point in uh, my, my career and how automatically without knowing it, my group had been slowly but surely working on with more and more data. Um, this is something that I think is worth thinking about if you're a young ag academic and trying to figure out how you w moved from one area of research to another, because there is always some logic somewhere. And now for case study number one. So case study number one is mind-boggling, to say the least. And this is a well-chosen term in that case, because uh, what do you think this cell is here? First of all, I tell you it's a cell. You could tell me maybe it's a galaxy, or maybe it's a star, or maybe it's close to a black hole. And what is that here? Is that an octopus or some sort of plankton or maybe some coral reef? It does look like all of that, a tree maybe. And uh, so in fact, what that is, is an astrocyte. And an astrocyte is a cell in the brain that does very, very many things. You see this animation on the right hand side to show you the complexity of this cell. And you can read in the two papers here the recent results that our PhD student Sofia Farina, uh, with colleagues in particular Alexander Skupin, have worked on. And um, so for now there are two papers, one on cut finite element methods, which is a version of extended finite element methods but with stabilization, and a second one which is uh, really working on mechanistic multi-scale modeling of energy metabolism in human astrocytes, which indicates that morphological effects have an impact on Alzheimer's disease, so uh, at least potentially. So this is the idea that uh, it's possible to make a model of astrocytes which takes into account their shape. Until now, the models of astrocytes had been punctual, so they had been one point. And all the equations that are solved in order to understand metabolism, so metabolism is you take some food in and you get some product out. So you metabolize what you eat. So for example, your muscles, they metabolize sugar, and they produce energy. So your neurons, they also need energy. And this energy is produced by astrocytes. And these astrocytes feed the neurons. And there is a hypothesis that maybe some astrocytes are too greedy, so they keep too much of the food for themselves, and they don't give it enough to the, to, uh, the neurons, which then starve and therefore degenerate. And that maybe could be linked to Alzheimer's disease. So this is what Sophia investigated. Let's see how that works in practice. All right, so first of all, an astrocyte, what is that? An astrocyte is a cell which has a lot of these little arms. And what are these arms for? So first of all, you see these little feet here. Um, it is a very abundant glial cell in the brain. It used to be thought to be completely useless and people had no idea what it was useful for. Uh, so when you don't know if something is useful, you think it's useless. That's one of the ways you can solve the problem. That's your a priori assumption on things. If you don't understand why, it's probably useless. Um, it's called astrocytes because it looks like a star and astro is related to star. Um, it has some feet, and these feet are here, and these feet are at the end of what is called a process. So these things are called processes, which can grow and shrink and disappear. So they are very dynamic, they don't stay the way they are, and they are lying on the blood vessels. And what comes through the blood vessels? Well, nutrients. So you have here the food coming in, the food is being, well, when I say food, I mean, I mean glucose and so on, and uh, oxygen and so on. So these things come in here, and they are metabolized by the astrocyte, and the astrocyte then uses its feet to feed the neurons. The neurons are these blue things here. So this is the way it works. So they connect, connect with the neurons, and they uh, can be in contact with 
up to 100,000 synapses. Okay, can you imagine? So just one astrocyte can be in contact with 100,000 synapses. So that's huge. And they have many functions which are related to their morphology and their location. So many functions. Let's see what they are uh, useful for. So first thing, they are what's called metabolic mediator between neurons and blood vessels. So what does that mean, metabolic mediator? It means that, well, you have blood vessels that come here. Um, the uh, astrocytes are metabolizing what you get from, uh, from the, the blood and transforming it into something that the neurons can eat and use. So basically, they transform raw materials coming from the blood vessels to something that the neurons can eat and use and then uh, live on. So they uptake glucose from the blood vessels, which is there. They perform the metabolism of glucose. So glucose gives pyruvate, gives lactate, and then the lactate goes inside the neurons. So that is what happens there. Uh, it's very important for the astrocytes to keep the high production of ATP for its own sustenance and lactate to support neurons. So what does that mean? It means that the astrocyte has some sort of trade-off. First of all, it needs to sustain itself because it needs to survive. And second, it needs to give AT, to give lactate to support the neurons because otherwise the neurons will not be able to work. So they need this lactate, which then gets transformed back into pyruvate and then PDH, and then that gives energy. You know? So this is basically what happens. Now, what is the hypothesis that we work based upon? So uh, you have in Nature Neuroscience in 2022, um, this is a picture of an astrocyte which is healthy. So you see the healthy astrocyte has very thin protuberances here, very thin processes, right? And these processes then land, land on the neurons. So they are very, as <coughs> they have thin uh, processes. Um, now you have also Alzheimer's like astrocyte and they look like this. So as you can see, they proliferate like crazy their processes are thicker and very bushy. They have much more of them. And this is what is believed to be related to Alzheimer's disease. The problem is, the question is why? So why is that, that the shape of the astrocyte has an impact? So this was the question that Sophia was working on during her PhD, uh, which was a wonderful PhD with Alex uh, Skupin. So she was working on trying to understand inside the astrocyte what the shape of the astrocyte has as an impact on its ability to produce lactate for the neurons. That was the goal of her PhD. And for the first time, we needed to make a model of an astrocyte. But a model which is based on the real geometry of the astrocyte. Um, so this is what the first part of the PhD was about trying to figure out if this is an astrocyte, which is very simplified rectangular box. The goal of the cell is to give lactate out and also to keep some ATP for itself. So the idea is um, that you have a sequence of chemical reactions, which you don't need to understand now because that's not the point. You just need to understand that there are coupled chemical reactions. So some of the of uh, the reagents and the products appear in different of these reactions. So these are modeled using ordinary differential, differential equations usually. But because in our case, we are interested in the spatial relations between things, we could not deal only with ordinary differential equations, but we needed partial differential equations. And that partial differential equation is this, this one. So this is a diffusion reaction equation. Diffusion, because we have this D Laplacian of U plus reaction, because this term tail tells you whether something disappears or something appears. This is exactly what you need for chemical reactions. And this is the rate of change of U, which is the quantity that you're interested in. 
Okay, so now uh, this is how things look like and what was shown is that uh, there is a direct link between the shape of the astrocyte and its ability to metabolize. So that was shown in a paper which is AMSES 2021 and BioArchive 2023, now the paper is accepted. And uh, what Sophia did is she took different types of astrocytes and looked at the approach that, the astro let's say, the results of these chemical reactions and was able to show a very clear and distinct role of the shape of the astrocyte on the ability of the astrocyte to metabolize. So then the second part was try to understand the calcium impact. So this is a calcium cycle which has to do with mitochondria as you can see here, and uh, I cannot explain all these uh, equations, but uh, again, there are coupled sets of partial differential equations uh, from the metabolic model and the calcium dynamics model. And so all of that was done in a code which is known as Phoenix. And what uh, Sophia did is she compared shapes which are round, which means that there is basically not much going on in terms of shape in the in the astrocyte, it's circular. And the second is uh, like a star shape, a bit like a shape of the, the astrocyte. And you assume that glucose comes in in that direction and lactate comes out from that direction here. And now the question is what happens if you look at the calcium signaling. And this is what you see in the results. So. As you can see, there is a wave that will come in. So this is the con calcium concentration versus space. And the two waves in the two cases are, um, as you will see, getting different with time. So you see that there is a phase shift that is building. So the circle is now this blue line and the star is the other line. So, and as you, as you continue the simulation, you see that the difference becomes more pronounced. So showing that the circle behaves differently than, uh, than the star in terms of calcium, um, of sending calcium inside the cell. And you can actually see it here because there is some delay in the star shape one that you don't see in the other one. So that was a very, very interesting uh, PhD uh, that finished a year ago. And uh, Sophia will now go to EPFL to work on the Blue Brain project, uh, which is one of the biggest European projects on the brain. It was 1 billion euros uh, funded uh, prob probably 10 years ago. And uh, so I'm very proud of her and I think she will do very well there. So now let's take a look at case study two. How can we help uh, surgeons navigate during their, uh, let's say, work when they are working on, in that case, breast cancer? So we are going to talk about a case which is very common, unfortunately, which is breast cancer. And uh, let me show you first the video. So we were here at the European Investment Bank in Luxembourg, this is the bank here. And in fact, the European Investment Bank is not a bank. It's uh, trying to fund projects worldwide, but this is not w uh, w in Europe, uh, but it's not what we are talking about today. What we're talking about here is how to make a scan of a person using a portable device, which is here this iPad and you can make a 3D scan using LiDAR of the person and using this 3D scan you're able to make a complete model of the person and uh, you are able to use it for modeling. Uh, if you remember we talked about point collocation methods where you only need a set of points. So we are using these approaches for two, uh, two problems, one in biomechanics and one in archaeology and we will come back to that later, to try to understand what happens in conflict zones and to reconstruct the cultural heritage through uh, LIDAR and other approaches that are used in the field. So what do we do here? Um, the question is, you know, breast cancer is 
really the cancer that kills the most amount of, of, of women uh, and men, actually. This is also possible in men. And, uh, of course, the idea would be to try to avoid uh, putting patients in dangerous situations. So what usually typically happens is that there is a pre-operative imaging of the breast and the idea is to try to figure out where the tumor is, if there is a tumor, and if, if it is uh, malignant and where it is and how to remove it. And uh, during the uh, imaging, the patient is lying on face down, but during surgery, lying face up. So that means that this is clearly going to be a problem when performing the surgery. Why? Well, because if you perform surgery in this situation, then the tumor will have moved around. If you perform surgery in that situation, then of course the tumor is at the same position, but you cannot perform surgery. So you have to turn the patient over. Otherwise, it's not possible to operate. So um, first problem is to localize the tumor inside here, the breast. And once you have localized the tumor, you would like to be able to tell the surgeon in this position, now on the back, what the situation of the tumor is, where is the tumor. And in order to do that, there are some tricks, uh, because currently what people are using, the surgeons are using preoperative drawings in order to sort of have a visual cue during surgery where things are. So before the operation, they make some drawings. During the operation, they use these drawings in order to figure out where to cut. So this is the state of the art. So what uh, Arnaud Mazier did during his PhD is to come up with an approach which does not require um, uh, such things or which helps in making these surgical drawings in order to help the surgeon navigate. So the question is, I know where the tumor is here. I want to know where the tumor is in the lying on the back position. I know where it is in the lying on the front position, so lying on the belly, and I want to perform this transformation. So this is the question, how do we do that? So the unique point about what we did here is that we assumed that the breast would be taken to the space station, uh, therefore that gravity would be removed completely. And then we reapplied gravity. So of course we did that virtually using a numerical model, which required solving the inverse hyperelastic problem. And again, this is quite rarely done and it allows in biomechanics to compute the rest position. So when you don't know the rest position, you compute it using inverse hyperelasticity. And I think this is something highly helpful, which um, is often neglected and should be taken into account in all biomechanics simulations because you never know the rest positions. You only measure the position in which the patient is at the moment. So if you take a tendon or a muscle and so on, everything is pre-stressed. So you cannot just say uh, that there is no stresses in it and that the rest position is known because it's not. So you solve first an inverse hyperelasticity problem and then a forward hyperelasticity problem. Um, so again, just to be clear, you remove gravity, then you change the direction in which gravity is applied. So you see here it's applied this way, now it's applied in that direction, and therefore it gives you a new deformed shape of the breast. So this is how it's done. This is done in Phoenix and uh, this is all open source and open access so you can just uh, download it and use it and this is absolutely uh, not a problem at all and it's relatively straightforward. So what uh, Arnaud did is the following. So it was really a multidisciplinary work relating biology, modeling, computational mechanics and computer science and he came up with an easy to use and flexible procedure uh, and uh, a robust model which is tested in clinical settings and also is fast. So this is what we're going to see. Again, the pipeline, which is the unique novelty of what we've done here, is to measure the prone configuration, so the configuration on the back. Move to the undeformed configurations, which means apply gravity in the opposite direction. Apply gravity towards the interior to get a new position and then compute the mean absolute error of the breast surface measured in the supine configuration 
to try to get what the parameters of the model are. Because here we have, of course, a lot of parameters, right? So we can measure that, right? Because we can see what the patient is like. So we can measure both the prone configuration and the supine configuration. Okay, so we can measure uh, lying on the belly and we can measure lying on the back. What we do is we compare the measurements using this slider approach to our predicted measurements. So again, we do what do we do? We do a comparison between what we think and what we see. Nothing different from before. It's all a learning process. And then we have a, let's say, maximum absolute error uh, threshold. And uh, we do a global minimization on these parameters in order to find the best parameters. And we oscillate, we, op we, uh, we do this, uh, this cycle until convergence and once we have the parameters of the model we can assume that uh, that we have the best model for the person and this takes only a few seconds so this is what's nice and if you look at the results it looks uh, like this so this is the model converging the parameters are adapting and the model is converging slowly to the measured configuration and now, when the configuration is found, you see that there is some oscillation around the, ex the solution that we're looking for. And finally, we converge. There is some markers that are used in order to minimize the error. And uh, we converge, and uh, the solution is then assumed to be correct. So there are lots of unknowns, because there are lots of questions that still need to be addressed in that sort of area. In particular, the stiffness of the muscles uh, underneath, uh, also what goes on um, with the ribs, what are the boundary conditions exactly, how is the breast attached to the rest of the body? There are lots of questions. Is it sliding? Is it sticking? So there are still some modeling issues to, to resolve, but the pipeline is there and is working uh, very beautifully anyway. So this is done uh, in a new piece of software, which is completely open source, and it's called Sonix, because it's the merger of SOFA and Phoenix. So Phoenix is a partial differential equation solver, which can solve on massively comp parallel computers, and SOFA is a real-time simulator, which can solve in real-time insertion of needles and cutting and deformation of soft tissues and so on. So the merger between the two uh, gives you Sonix, which is a very fast approach, which, and this is the unique point about this approach, is that you can change the constitutive law by changing one line of code. So if you want a new material model, you change only one line of code in Phoenix, and that will be inherited directly by SOFA. So it means that the SOFA framework now inherited the flexibility of Phoenix to be able to solve arbitrary large deformation problems with arbitrary constitutive laws like Ogden, Holzapfel, Poro Elastic, and so on. So this is a really uh, wonderful piece of code, which is on top of that uh, error estimator based, which allows you to control the error in time. So the title of the paper is Develop Intuition on Biomechanical Systems Through Interactive Error Control Simulations. And it's now accepted in engineering with computers in 2023. Um, so what's really nice is that you can use element topology, material models, and the complex tensorial derivation of the nonlinear functionals is done directly in the simulator in Phoenix, and you don't need to know what's going on in detail, which means that any person that knows what material model they want to put in there, any person in biomechanics can directly use that and will be able to have real-time simulations uh, available. And uh, so, yeah, so this is how, the, how things look. And um, we could discuss that outside of this particular lecture if you're interested. And this is a demonstrator. So you have here a haptic feedback device. So it gives you a force feedback when you use it. So you see you hold it here with your hand. And at the same time, you're probing on the right-hand side uh, the lever. And uh, you feel the sense of touch at the same time as you probe, right? So this is what you have here. This W, W, um, uh, this is exactly what you put in terms of, in terms of strain energy uh, function. And you can probe the liver and get a solution in real time. 
And if you change the material model, you will be able to get a new material model for the liver by changing one or two lines of code in Phoenix without touching SOFA at all. So uh, this is the novelty of this work. And I think it's really a beautiful piece of work. Um, again, in, um, in biomechanics, as we said, now we talk about modeling the liver or the breast, and we, uh, we worked and we pioneered the use of error control in biomechanics, in particular goal-oriented errors, and we have a few examples in this uh, paper which I recommend you read, and there are also four publications that you can flash here and read if you're interested. It gives you the idea of how to use goal-oriented adaptive mesh refinement for hyperelastic soft tissues. And this paper is a tutorial that helps understand how to use goal-oriented approaches and how important it is. And it shows that the quantity of interest, for example, on this diabetic foot here, can have a huge impact on the type of mesh that you, that you get. All right, so now we talked about this uh, case study. And in this case study, we were somewhere in between having an idea about what the model was, because the model was a hyperelastic model. We supposed that, although, as you know, poor elastic models are also very useful in biomechanics. We saw this for cancer in the talk on cancer uh, that I gave, uh, that poor elastic models are very worthwhile. Um, and we also used data because this data was in fact used to model the, the person in real life. You know, we use LIDAR and uh, also imaging in order to adapt the model because the model we had a priori had parameters which we didn't know and we adapted the model in terms of what types of hyperelastic models we needed and what parameters we needed for this hyperelastic model. There is still some work to do there of course. But um, I think this is a very good example of how to adapt a model to a particular case of a patient in order to be patient uh, specific. So now we're going to move to case study three. And case study three is really a mixture between uh, between having a lot of data and having some idea of what the uh, models are. So um, this is a very exciting project, uh, which is called Adonis Archaeological Digital Forensics. Uh, the guy you see here is Juan, our PhD student, and he is uh, in Mosul in Iraq, and he's measuring and he is taking LiDAR images of a whole structure. So just before I showed you how to take LiDAR images of bankers in the European Investment Bank, and now what I'm talking about is how to take digital images of real places. So this is in Iraq, in Mosul, and I will tell you the story about this that Juan will tell much better than me but which is really fascinating and I think can give a lot of ideas as to what can be done with mathematical modeling in real life. So what you see here is that we are in Tel Nebi Yunus in Mosul. So this is a very uh, important place because this is the hill of the prophet Yona. This is what that means. Tel Nebi Yunus. Yunus is Yona. Tel Nebi is the hill of the prophet in Mosul. And uh, it's a very important place because it was destroyed. Uh, an Assyrian palace was found underneath. Then there was an early Christian monastery there that was built. Uh, from there, there was an Ottoman mausoleum that was built. And then Saddam Hussein remodeled this mausoleum. And then the Islamic State destroyed the mausoleum and the Islamic State created some tunnels in order to go and steal some artifacts from the Assyrian palace that was below. And this is, these are the tunnels that you see here. And this is the same tunnel in which Juan is now making some measurements using LiDAR and using some um, rover that he created. 
He uh, used uh, data acquisition in 2018 and 2019 using photogrammetry. The entire uh, site surface was scanned. 350 uh, from the 600 meters of the tunnels were scanned. And the architectural uh, features were also scanned and georeference so that you can know where things are. So that led to a full model of the place. Uh, you could see that the walls are tilted, the floors are slanted, there are some stone panels that are broken, like here, and that you have large cracks everywhere. And the question is to ask questions looking at the present on what was the past. So we are really asking the question, when was the monastery first built? And for how long was the, place, the palace exposed to the monastery's mass? Because you have here the Assyrian palace and you do not know exactly when things were built precisely so you would like to go back in the past by looking at the deformation in the present so the unique thing we are do doing here is using gravity as a dating method so we are re really using the fact that uh, this mausoleum and all the other buildings that were built and destroyed over the years were weighing upon these palace to try to figure out what happened in which order and this is something which is extremely interesting and very challenging. It's founded by the Institute of Advanced Studies at the University of Luxembourg. I also recommend you take a look at the webpage of the Institute of Advanced Studies because there are some possibilities for fellowships, for postdoctoral fellows as well as PhD students, and uh, very major pro uh, programs of exchange with uh, the whole world. So it would be worth taking a look at. So now the case study looks like this. This is the site from outside. So this is a century old cultural heritage site and also a place of worship. Uh, it was severely destroyed by the Islamic State from 2014 till 2016. Um, so this is what we would like to do. The specific research questions are trying to explain the deformation of the place and what can be learned from these deformations. So in the past, we expect things were like that. In the present, we see it like that. So how can we go back to the past from the present? It's really back to the future, but in that case, inverted. So this is what uh, Juan is doing here. He is uh, basically measuring what is going on in the palace. So there is a lot of challenges, for example, acquisition of data in a post-conflict zone, how to work with incomplete data, because we are missing a lot of data here. Uh, we have la lack of accuracy, lack of completeness, and lack of transparency in decision-making uh, during the virtual reconstruction process. So these things are extremely difficult. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to build, and this is the computational novelty. I think uh, that this is quite unique to what we are doing. We are scanning, so this is what Juan scans, so you can see very many details here. And of course, you don't need all these details to do computations. In particular, you're solving an inverse problem, you're looking at the present, and you're trying to go back to the past. It's a very ill post problem. So you don't need all these details, but what you would like to know is which details you do need and which details you don't need. And you'd like to be able to do that in a, in a smart way. Um, so this is how you do it. Uh, how can we intelligently reduce the point cloud? So this is related to the talk I gave on point collocation method, which you, you can look at, and uh, where we talk about how to build collocation schemes and smart clouds based on what you actually know in terms of the error. So an error-driven smart point cloud generation. So that allows us to decimate the point cloud, and instead of having billions of points, have maybe millions of points, which is already a lot, but still manageable. And then from these, we can solve the inverse problem by solving forward problems, forward optimization problems, and then uh, measuring the error on the uh, quantity of interest, which is in our case, the deformation of the ground. And uh, in order to show how that works in practice, what um, we did is uh, we worked on a method that we call scan to simulation where we went in actual buildings, which is the building where the university is located, and we took one of the staircases, which is the biggest one, 19 stories. This is the building that I showed uh, on uh, some of the first slides of the University of Luxembourg and the whole research Luxembourg. And uh, this is the fourth floor here, and this is going down and up to the 19th floor. And <coughs> Sorry, we wanted to know what would happen if there was a fire 
in this building because it's a very tall building. And uh, so what we did, what Juan did with Pratik is um, our postdoc from Marie Curie fellow, he, uh, they scanned the whole staircase with a lighter and um, then they assumed that a fire would be uh, started at the bottom. And the question was, where would the fire spread? Would it spread to the whole top? Of course, we had a model of fire, which was quite a simplistic model, but we started from the beginning. And then the second question is, where would the smoke actually propagate if we opened the vents at the top, which was done in one of the exercises when the tower had to be evacuated, or if we closed the vents at the top and we wanted to understand whether this uh, Maison du Savoir was designed to have the vents closed or the vents open at the top in order to avoid that the smoke would uh, spread. So since the staircase is used in order to evacuate people, as you can see, if you open the vents at the top, it plays the role of a chimney and people are smoked inside the staircase and they would likely die and not be able to escape. So the idea is clearly not to open the vents. This is what the simulations show, because if you don't open the vents, the smoke is contained to a relatively small area. Of course, we had to make assumptions for the simulation, but um, I think it shows the power of the scan to simulation approach that we developed. Let's move to the fourth case study, and this is a case study on the digital version of the meniscus, the paper that was submitted to PNAS. Um, um, the, the big question here is what is the function of the meniscus and what is the relation between the function of the meniscus and its microstructure? So now, the meniscus is a piece of spongy material between the femur and the rest of your leg, which means that it is located here in the, in the middle. And the question is, what is the role of its microstructure and its ability to absorb energy? Because the idea is that the meniscus is here to absorb energy. So this is really uh, the key question about the meniscus. And this question can be answered by looking at the actual microstructure of the meniscus using advanced imaging that was done by Olga Barrera in uh, Oxford. And uh, by looking at microscopy, you're able to look at microscopic pores and channels that are 50 to 100 microns in diameter, so quite small, and in order to understand what these channels are here for. And the idea in the end is to simplify these channels. So this is the unique idea that uh, we are putting forward here. The uniqueness of the approach is to look at the actual microstructure, but then to simplify this microstructure to make it amenable to 3D printing. And in order to do that, uh, we uh, generated some simpl simplified synthetic microstructures to test using CFD. And using this CFD on synthetic microstructures, the idea being that you are lacking data because there are not so many menisci that you can take samples of. It is uh, difficult to get to and it's also um, time consuming and expensive to scan. So the idea is to try to extract the knowledge about the microstructure and to generate simplified microstructures using machine learning. So from there we have a, an almost infinite number of cases that we can generate by hand that have the same sort of statistical distributions for the pores, for the connectivity, for the tortuosity of the pores. Therefore, we can generate fake microstructures, let's say, but which look like the real microstructure and then do some tests and then optimize the microstructure in a way which is more simple than the real microstructure. Because we think, of course, that the real microstructure is the optimal in terms of what the meniscus is supposed to do. But because we cannot manufacture such a complex microstructure, we'd like to simplify it and do it in a way which preserves the properties in terms of energy absorption of the meniscus. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, what we hope we can do is, in fact, copy what nature has optimized over hundreds of years, thousands of years, um, in order to make something simpler. 
So this is the digital meniscus. And when you look at this, it really looks like a, like a sponge and you can dive into the little channels and you can see uh, how, it, how they look. So what we did is that we looked at the channels as ways to change the porosity of the material. So what we said is, okay, let us erode the channels so that we can make them wider and let us make sure that um, we can look at the different types of porosities in the channels. So let us uh, try to, to do that and see what happens. So the, the novelty here, the uniqueness of the approach is that we are uh, looking at different microstructures, but only using one microstructure as an example. So we start from one microstructure, we modify it to test different hypotheses on the role of the microstructure on the propagation of the fluid inside this uh, meniscus. So we take one sample with no erosion. So that comes directly from the meniscus sample that we have. So it's an MRI image that gives us this. And then we erode the microstructure. So if you look at the channel here, they are thin. And if you look here, they are wider. So it means that we eat away some of the material in order to make the channels larger. So that's the basic point. And then we increase again the porosity. If you compare these two images here, you see the channel is there. If you look here, the porosity is larger, so there are more pores. So this is the point. This is the uniqueness of our approach here, is to modify the microstructure starting from an existing one in order to test some hypotheses. So we have now three types of microstructures with increasing porosity from left to right. And we're going to solve the problem in here using DCPSC, a method that I covered in more detail in the collocation method course. That's also on YouTube. And this is what we found. <coughs> so the, the connectivity of the pores is shown here. So this is an image which is a bit difficult to, to understand, but it tells you how the pores are interconnected uh, with each other. So it's a quite useful way of thinking about things. Um, and here are the results. So if we look at uh, these four different porosities, so the first one is the initial one without modification, and then the three latest ones are the ones that are modified. So of course, as expected, second one has higher porosity, third one has even more porosity, and um, and so on. So this is essentially what, what we did. So we have now the, here the frequency of the number of pores that have a certain opening, you see. So the, if you take the pores and you look at what is the probability of having a certain opening, uh, this is what you see here. So here, uh, this is less pores. This is the first version, more pores and even more pores. So you see that the distributions look the same, which is already good. And these are, for example, here, there are 40 uh, pores that have this uh, porosity level, right? So this is the idea. And here there are uh, 50 pores that have this porosity level. Mm? So this is the idea of, the, of these histograms. And uh, now this is the tortuosity, which means how uh, straight the channels are. So if you look at the first one, the channels are like that. In the second one, they are less tortuous, which makes complete sense because since we are merging the uh, channels together, the tortuosity will be less because the path from for a, a water particle inside the channels will be smaller in order to get from one place to another because there is, uh, there is more void and less material in between. And if you take the third case, the tortuosity is even more decreased, which makes also complete sense. And now if we look at the actual results, we see something which is very exciting because why? We uh, look at the frequency of the normalized velocity in the pores. So we take the velocity in all the pores and we plot the number of times we measure this velocity 
using CFD. We are all solving everything using CFD here, using a DCPSC, mesh-free particle method, and we are looking at the normalized velocity. So for example, if we take the value of velocity uh, 0.05 here, in the first case where we have 1.7 bars, which is relatively low pressure, uh, we have quite a high number of instances of this of this value. So we have 2,500 points in the system which see this velocity, right? So we have a lot of points that are be beyond 2,000 in terms of, um, we have over 2,000 points which are beyond this velocity that are about 0 0.05. On the other hand, if we take uh, 0.6 in terms of velocity, we see there is almost no pore that has a velocity of 0.6. All right, so now let's compare the two approaches. So here we have a pressure which is 1.7 bars and here a pressure of 2.1 bars. So as you can see, the 1.7 bar pressure leads to quite a lot of very small velocities inside, which you can expect because the pressure is less. So therefore you have a lot meaning there is a peak in small velocities, okay? A lot of points in the domain have low velocities. And you have here this little bell-shaped curve, which gives you an idea uh, that you are roughly, uh, you have an average velocity of about, you know, 0 0.25 here in this little uh, distribution. And if you now take a much larger pressure, 2.1 bar, then you can see that these uh, low velocities don't appear because they are all higher. And you see this little bell-shaped curve, which is centered around 0 0.35, right? And that tells you what the distribution of the velocities are. And this is in the actual microstructure. Uh, now, if you look in the, in the higher um, porous case, what you see is that uh, there is almost no difference between the 1.7 bar and the 2.1 bar. And uh, so the results look like that. And what's really interesting is that, interesting is that in the normalized velo maximum velocity, so you take the maximum velocity in the whole sample and you compare to the inlet pressure, what you see is that in the original case, you see this behavior. But in the case where you increase the porosity, you do not see this change in behavior, which means that there is some sort of change in the regime, which you see only in the case of the real meniscus, which indicates that the porosity level has an impact, a strong impact on the ability of the porous material to filter high velocities. So it basically means that the high velocities are filtered out thanks to the presence of the microstructure. So uh, this is uh, this case study. And again, here we were in a case where we are halfway between small and big data with an adaptive model, because we, in that case, modified the geometry of the model. And uh, we kept the material model constant, but we modified the geometry uh, of the porosity and the porous structure in order to understand what goes on in the, in the meniscus. Okay, and this is what can uh, lead us to understanding what digital twins are. So um, I would like to give some partial conclusions. So we had some multidisciplinary case uh, studies here with partial information and data on the system. We showed some real-time data simulation and identification, including error control and quality assurance using error estimation. We have some open source codes that allow us, us to go from image to simulation and from scan to simulation pipelines with smart point cloud simulations. So now I'm going to show you um, the first, the fifth case study. So this is case study number five. Um, this is a case study done with Ceratizit in Luxembourg. So this is a company that focuses on working on very hard surfaces. So the idea is that they would like to come up with tools which are super resistant to wear. 
Uh, this is funded by the Bridges program of the Luxembourg National Research Fund and uh, takes place in the University of Luxembourg. It's led by Eleni Koronaki, who is uh, got a Marie Curie Fellowship in our group. And uh, the two PhD students are Paris and uh, Jeremy. So the idea of industrial coatings is that you can see them everywhere. So on cutlery, you can see them on wheels, you can see them on watches, on airplanes, you can see them on satellites, on uh, solar panels, and so on. So you'd like to, you need advanced materials. So the question is, how are you going to make these things work? Uh, so the goal is to be able to predict the product quality, to optimize the process, and to get optimized resource management. So we have complex geometries with a hundred different chemical reactions and unknown physical parameters and uncertainty quantification. So question is, how can we model these things? So uh, if we are humans and machines, how can we work together and try to come up with models that are adaptive and try to simulate what goes on in real life? Um, okay, so the idea is to try to create a digital twin, of course, of the reactor process. Because what is done here is that you have a chemical reactor and this chemical reactor is going to create a coating. Uh, it's a chemical vapor deposition. And this CVD process uh, has to be simulated in order to be understood better. And this is the goal of the simulations that we're talking about here. So this is how the simulator uh, looks like. This is also how the reactor looks like. First question is, of course, what is the geometry like? So we have laminar transient incompressible flow, ideal gas mixture, uniform temperature inside the domain. That's an assumption. Again, we're ass assuming a lot of things. And we have one million degrees of freedom here. Uh, then there is a pulse boundary condition for each inlet. So you can imagine that there is an inlet here coming in, here, 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 and so on. And there is a pulse that goes like that. For each of the inlets, there will be a pulse of input. And there is a phase difference between the pulses due to the rotational uh, speed, which is two uh, rotations per minute, and 60 degree difference between the axis connecting the holes to each disc, and two holes on each disc are placed antipodally, so oppositely. Um, so we have quite a number of reactions. And now it's not very uh, important which ones that they are. Uh, the idea is that what we do is we adopt the simplest possible schemes that are available in the uh, literature it's because we have less chemical species, therefore less degrees of freedom. So the references are here. I encourage you to take a look at them. So this is here the precursor concentration and the H2O concentration in the domain. And uh, you can see uh, that uh, we are able to simulate that. So now, why is that even useful? Because the problem is, how do you optimize the geometry of these things? And how do you optimize the inlet? So how do you optimize what you put in, in order to get the best possible quality of material at the end? So the quantity of interest is the quality of the material and the thickness of the chemical vapor deposited material. and what you can control it, what comes, what comes in. So there are different methods that can be used, regression trees, random forest, GBRT, XGBoost, and ANNs. And there are a bunch of advantages and drawbacks that you can uh, take a look at. If you're uh, interested, you, I can uh, send you the slide or you can make a copy. Um, I'm not going to go into uh, all the details, but um, for example, here, what you see is what happens with XG boost. So you have training time of 30 seconds, prediction time 0.1 seconds, um, which is 90,000 times faster than the CFD approach. So the idea is you train the algorithm based on the CFD simulations, and then you use that to predict instead of solving. So you predict a bit like model auto reduction, and then you get a solution out without needing to solve in real time <coughs> uh, in the online phase. So what is done is uh, ML unsupervised learning. So the offline is production data thickness. So this is a different approach now. 
you have the production, which is the data thickness. Then you use a clustering algorithm. So for example, spec spectral clustering, k-means, and so on. And then you find common characteristics of the production runs that impact the process parameters. So this is very useful because what you do is you start from the data that's actually coming out of, of the company, uh, of the production. And directly on that, you can use clustering and you can find then common characteristics. And then you use these uh, clusterings in order to help uh, with the model. So this is what goes on here. So there are some clusters that you can identify. And uh, that is actually very interesting because uh, these findings that are done using machine learning are very similar to what the rule of thumb that uh, the company has developed over decades, which means that machine learning was able to rediscover what humans had uh, known, which is the first step. And now the next step is going to be to try to predict uh, things that humans have not yet known because they have not thought about it yet. Um, and what was done also is to try to see if it's possible to use the same approaches as was done for the uh, chemical reactor as what was done for to help the astrocyte modeling. If you I want to take a look at the astrocyte presentation, you can then uh, figure out what is uh, meant by that. But uh, the idea is to use the same approaches in order to see how that can help with the modeling of astrocytes. In that case, the astrocyte is a, is a rectangle and it is a cell in the brain. I refer you to the presentation on astrocytes <clears throat> in order to understand better what that means. But what that actually shows is that the very important ATP to ADP ratio um, is predictable using the machine learning algorithms. And this is a very, very nice uh, conclusion. So <clears throat> now I will move to uh, case study six. Uh, case study six has to do with data-driven approaches for urban wind energy harvesting. And this is led by one of our uh, Marie Curie Fellows, Anina sarkic glumak who also got a Marie Curie Fellowship, and she's working on trying to harvest energy inside urban environments. So the idea is, can you put a wind turbine on the top of this building and try to figure out if you can get the maximum output in terms of electricity? So, of course, that answers a problem, which is to try to generate lo locally the energy that we need, because that would be very desirable. And there is a technological solution, which is wind turbines in the built environment. But still, we are still searching for performance, which means accelerated wind flows. And the main quantities of interest are wind speeds, wind direction, characteristics, and turbulence, because you don't want too much turbulence where you put a wind turbine, otherwise you would either destroy the wind turbine or decrease its ability to generate power. So this project Data for Wind, which is funded by the FNR, combines the computational and experimental wind engineering with data assimilation techniques to reliably predict flow patterns with complex urban wind canopies. Okay, so that's the way it looks. You have a real urban area, you have CFD, computational fluid dynamics, and you have, wi you have wind tunnel models. And this is going to lead to data assimilation methodologies in order to have reliable predictions of quantities of interest. So let's see how this is done and what's unique about the approach here. So the idea is to include data assimilation. So what that means is that you make actual measurements and you would like to see how these measurements are going to impact your numerical models and how you can update the numerical model and the material model to take into account the data that you have. So this is the idea. Uh, how do we do it practically? First of all, we have wind tunnel experiments, which Anina has made. So you have a wind tunnel, you have a fake building, you have a wake here. <coughs> and the idea is that you usually have, a, have an error here because when you use RANS or K omega and so on, you have an over prediction of the separation bubble, which means this separation bubble at the back is a typical problem in these wind engineering problems, 
where you have this overprediction of the bubble. So the bubble size is much bigger. So the idea in the data simulation is that instead of using these methods uh, which are non-parameterized by actual measurements, you use the wind tunnel to calibrate the RANS simulations and then you are able to much better improve the simulation. So the observational data are the velocities in the vertical plane and the LES data are validated with wind tunnel measurements. So the idea is that you try to fit the RANS on the LES and the LES are driven by what you see in the wind tunnels. Okay, so you essentially have an LES, large eddy simulation, which gives you these little bubbles here. And this little uh, bubble is what you expect from the wind tunnel. You use these LES to up improve the RANS and then you use the RANS, which is much faster. But instead of using a RANS out of the box, you use a RANS which is trained on the large eddy simulations data, which themselves are learned from data simulation. So I think that's basically uh, the key points to remember here. So the data set looks like that. So you have a building, you have the back, left, right and front, and you have in incoming velocities like this. Right, so this is the top view and the wind can come at the, from that direction or this direction or this direction and you measure all these directions. So this is the training set. Uh, so you, tra you train RANS plus LES, right? <clears throat> and wind tunnel is used for validation. So you train the machine learning algorithm at 0, 7.5 degrees, 15 and so on until 45. And um, this is what you actually try to figure out. So what are the questions? So what's unique about what we do is that we train RANS from LES based on wind tunnel data. And then we try to use that in other scenarios which we haven't seen yet. So first question is what data should be used? What's necessary to train the LES simulations? What is the best machine learning model to use? And should, what should we use single output or multi output? And finally, what is the size of the domain? And um, yeah, so basically uh, we showed some multidisciplinary case studies uh, with partial information, real-time data simulation, error control, open source codes, <coughs> and scan to simulation pipelines. I could have shown many other examples um, <coughs> in the team, and I hope that you uh, enjoyed the, the discussion. And uh, there are here some publications that you can scan and uh, read uh, directly if, uh, if you are interested. And, um, and that is it. I thank you very much for your attention. And uh, maybe we can take questions now. I think maybe that would be a good idea. So I also refer you to the books, Partition of Unity Methods and Material Point Methods, that uh, this one will come out in October, and this one came out uh, already.